They run four of the most important universities in the country. They are all located in Ontario's capital city. Yes, they all compete for students, but you might be surprised to learn they frequently get together to improve the educational experiences of the more than 200,000 students, faculty, and staff they serve and employ. It's a virtual city within the city. And with that, we welcome Toronto's four university presidents introduced in chronological order. Not them, but their institutions. Merrick Gertler is president of the University of Toronto, established in 1827. Sarah Diamond is president of OCAD University, established in 1876. Mohamed Lashemi is president of Ryerson University, established in 1948. And Mamdou Shukri, president of York University, established in 1959. Mr. and Madam Presidents, it's great to have you all here at TVO tonight. Thanks for coming. Great to be here. Let us start, we want to talk about a, a bunch of issues that you four are dealing with right now, but we want to start with transportation because you have all, I gather, worked together to conceive, fund, and affect the largest survey on transit and transportation probably in Canadian history. And to that end, Sheldon, if you would, that's not Sheldon Levy, your predecessor. This is Sheldon Osmond, our director. Let's start with this. 15,000 complete responses you got to this university survey of students. You found out a third of students spend, imagine this, two hours or more per day traveling to and from campus. 25% of respondents live 20 kilometers or more from school. Let's start very generally with this. President Gertler, what's the point of collecting all this information? Well, the point is uh, we have between us about 180,000 students that we enroll at our various campuses. Many of them, in fact, most of them are commuters. Uh, and so we have a natural interest in ensuring that their daily experience is as good as it can possibly be. We want them to spend more time on our campuses, uh, interacting with their fellow students, their faculty members, uh, and enga engaging in student life. Uh, the more time they have to spend every day getting to and from our campuses, uh, the worse their experience is. So we collected this data as a way to uh, help transportation planners make better transportation investments with our students in mind. Of course, it will also help our faculty and our staff if we can improve the transit system in the GTA. President yeah. Diamond, if, they're, if they're, they're no doubt spending too much time in cars, or um, on subways or on streetcars or in any number of different ways getting to your institutions, the implications of which are, I guess, a lot of people are choosing courses depending on what time they can get to school. That's right. You, you want students to plan their academic career um, based on really what a rich curriculum will provide for them rather than trying to bank their learning experience in two or three days in order to avoid um, you know, having to deal with rush hour traffic, challenges with transit, um, or try and get to, um, to school later on in the day so they avoid rush hour. Um, but I think it's important to talk about why we've chosen to work together on this. Mm -hmm. Because we felt that um, if we could provide a kind of objective viewpoint on data, uh, we would be very helpful to problem solving in a new kind of way. And we all have faculty who work in the area of either data analytics or visualization, and we're actually able to create a tool set for, um, for analysts, for What's planners. What's that mean, a tool set? Oh, give, give a, a planner of transportation systems something that's very visual that shows the impact <coughs> of <coughs> the kind of transit um, gaps that we have. Mm -hmm in the GTA. Gotcha. Um, really make that very, very clear, very visual, and uh, help them make more, more informed decisions. President Lashmi, you as a university can't go out and spend a billion dollars to build a new LRT or a new subway in order to make it easier for your students to get there on time. But what can you do to improve things? I think the most important thing, and this is uh, the, really the, uh, the why we did this survey, is really to understand the behavior how students are using the transit system. Because I uh, believe this is a first step for uh, more collaboration between the four universities, really to address the issues that are faced by our students. And if we understand the uh, transit behavior and how students are using the system, we can really work with the city of Toronto in enhancing uh, services, but also look at alternatives, how we can support better students while they're on campus. In our case at Ryerson University, more than 80% of our students are commuters. 80%? More than 80% of, of Ryerson our, students it, commute. Exactly. Hmm. So it's important for us also to provide them with the right uh, support while they're 
uh, here with us on, on campus and also find other alternatives for them to minimize the time of transit. And definitely uh, we don't have the uh, funding for that, but I think it's important for us to address the issue and uh, I hope that with other projects we can work together to see what are the other solutions that we can provide to students. President Shukri, I'm guessing that uh, probably 80 percent of your students yeah. commute as well. To, to a great there? extent and uh, I think as you heard it's uh, wonderful because we have data as you suggested it's a large amount of data that uh, will help create evidence to support decision making. It will support public policy development there's another side to this too. Remember, we are also in the business of knowledge generation and knowledge dissemination. So this is a great opportunity for our students to be engaged in research, for our students and they, you, under the supervision of some of the best faculties in urban planning and all related uh, fields that they have data that they can mine and they can publish future papers, they can uh, inform themselves, inform the city. The other thing about the collaboration is that it's also supported by other activities that has been going on. Our uh, York City Institute yesterday was celebrating its 10th anniversary and this is a whole research institute that's focused around city building and city planning. So they have their own data, now new set of data that will help complement what they have. So the, the output of this will continue to come as we go in the future, as more students come and look at the data, more researchers look at the data. And again, this is part of university's commitment to support uh, public policy development. Right. There's a couple of other things um, that are really interesting about the data. Um, one is that we see that the majority of our students work. So, you know, that's a very... The majority of your students work, have they jobs work. outside they school. They have jobs yeah. outside of school. Yeah. So, um, and it's very rich data. You know, it's looking not only at transit patterns, it's looking at socioeconomic data on those individuals, uh, demographics in terms of age, um, work, etc. So you're able to actually understand the pattern the patterns of what it is to be a student um, in the GTA at this point in time. Um, and it actually begins to lever into another issue that we're working on, which is affordable housing. We're going to come to that in a yeah. second. Is that your, I mean, okay, our, our, my university experience is 35 yeah. years in the rearview rear view mirror <coughs> at your place, incidentally. But my recollection was not that many people held jobs on the side when I went to university. Is that a change now? That certainly has changed. Um, when we look at the demographic composition of our universities, we know that typically uh, over half of them, half of our students, are on financial aid of one sort or another. Uh, we now have discovered that over half of them hold part-time jobs. Yeah. Um, they have multiple lives. Uh, they are students, they are employees, they are family members. Many of them live at home and, and have to support members of their own family as well. So um, the, these data that we've just collected give us a new window into their daily experiences and help us plan not only for better transportation experiences yeah. but for better overall experiences. I wonder how jealous you and you and you are of him because you're getting a brand new billion dollar subway to your yeah. university opening soon. Now you didn't pay for it but I wonder how oh. Oh, you're going you're gonna to quibble with me on that. We, we, we paid for it. We offered the land. Okay, but <laughs> the citizens of Ontario are paying for it. Yeah. But put it this way, how's that going to change the educational experience for students at York University, the fact you're going to be able to subway right to school? Absolutely, because it will, I mean, generally accessibility to York and to other parts of the city will be, I mean, remember mm -hmm. the subway will take people from the Vaughan area and the York region to downtown as well. The important thing, to be honest, is to make sure that our students are getting the best experience in classrooms, outside the classroom, in their way to school, given the circumstances that uh, Merrick just mentioned, uh, uh, their needs and their, their, uh, their schedules. So we try to create the best learning environment and experience for the students in these very important years. So uh, the subway will help everybody, will make it, it will make your accessible, and it's part, of, honestly, of some uh, incredible transformation that's happening on your campus. Does it mean that, sorry, so I get to one sec, does it mean that there will be more, I don't know the right term for this, cross-fertilization between your institutions Absolutely. together? Yeah. Like that, you was, that, was point. that was your point? Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. already have, um, actually I was looking at the amount of research that's happening between uh, the four universities um, and we're very small but we're very engaged in research and it is really exciting and um, this means that you can not only work virtually but with much greater ease, you know, uh, 
hotel in each other's labs, work with industry partners who we share, and really have that incredible uh, kind of virtuous circle of creativity mm -hmm. and research between the four institutions. So it benefits all of us. Sure does. Do you imagine? I'll just add yeah. an element uh, that is important. I think this will give more flexibility for students to navigate between the four universities. But I would say that the adding uh, subway line will not really solve the problem in the GTE because we have students that are coming from all corners of the GTE, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we know the uh, the challenges that the citizens in the city are facing in terms of transportation. So this will be definitely, I think, a move in the right direction. But we have to think about people who are coming from all corners of the GTA. And this is why, in terms of when you look at the number of hours students are spending per day, it's because they're coming from mm -hmm. far away from our campuses. You asked if we were jealous. The answer is yes. Um, <laughs> when, when people think of U of T, they naturally think of the St. George campus. But we have three campuses, one in Mississauga and one in Scarborough. And the Scarborough campus, in particular, has been right in the middle of a big debate about the future of transit investments in the GTA. You're getting a subway, uh, too. Well, we hope we are. Think, we're actually, yeah. the LRT will perhaps be even more useful mm. and important to us, and perhaps money better spent. Mm. Uh, but it just underscores, and this comes back to the survey again, how important as a piece of social infrastructure our public transit system is because it allows uh, the residents of the GTA and their kids to attend universities and colleges. Really, really critical in, in enabling them to reach their full potential. So we need to think of investments in transportation in those terms. But I wonder if, the, if something as simple, it's not that simple, but you know what I'm saying here, as the construction of a subway to York University Take us 10 years down the road. Does that mean somebody will be able to get a York U of T degree because getting from one campus to the next will be so much easier? No question. It, it really does enable all kinds of uh, cooperation and thinking about those permutations Absolutely. Now? Yeah. Okay. Mohammed? Uh, we already have a pilot project with York University where we are giving students the opportunity to take courses in their programs from York and, uh, and Ryerson. And I think this is the beginning of a good collaboration. And we hope that that collaboration could be fruitful in the future. Mamdi. Let me point out to something else. I mean, it, 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 I'm, I'm glad that you invited us. I'm glad that we started now to realize the importance of sharing this collaborative effort with the, with the community. But collaboration among the four universities has been going on for a long time. Many of the things that are happening. We have joint research uh, institutes, research structures. Uh, I'm reminded just uh, the other day by the work we are doing together in the, to, uh, it appeared in the media as if we're just doing uh, work for the refugees jointly, mm -hmm. for refugees from Syria. Well, the bar, an interesting part of this is the, there's an academic underpinning for this community work. Mm -hmm. It's not just, it's not charity, it's not community work, there's academic underpinning for that. Mm -hmm. We have a large institute for refugee studies, one of the oldest mm -hmm. in the country. It happens to exist at York University. It is collaborating with, most certainly with U of T and other universities, creating the academic underpinning of some of the things that we're doing, mm -hmm. talking about migrations and, 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 and uh, refugees throughout the world and it's this historic perspective, political and economic perspective. Since you raised that, let's jump to that right now because, Mohammed, it was your university that sort of, I guess, led the way in an attempt to uh, reach out to the Syrian refugees who are coming here. What was the thinking behind that? I mean, the thinking is really um, part of our contribution to society. I think universities have to also to have a responsibility to see uh, what the best ways that we can help society and. Um, we reach out to our sister universities. The response was extremely positive. Uh, the uh, target at the beginning was really to uh, sponsor about 10, uh, 10 families. We ended up with uh, 75 families. 75. And we raised $3 million. And I think uh, the most important thing, what uh, also Mamdou mentioned, is the opportunities that we are offering also to our students to learn from this experience. This is also experiential learning from our students. We have also similar programs. And I think we have about, at Ryerson, we have about 400 students that are volunteering to help those Syrian families. But this is also part of the learning that the learning opportunities we offer to our students. I think, sure. um, you know, sometimes um, we forget the critical role that universities play in forming citizens. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the, exactly the kind of project um, that teaches students about social responsibility, how to facilitate a community integrating mm -hmm. so they have a positive net uh, economic impact, how to think about the sort of culture that's coming from um, this 
group of, uh, of refugees and how to bring that positive culture you know, into Canadian culture because Syria is a phenomenally rich historical site. Um, and uh, it's very exciting to see um, that job, which is very specific, something that universities have taken on, which is to form the citizens of the future so that people will engage in sustained democratic structures and processes in this country and integrate um, not only Syrian refugees, but others who are coming from many different kinds of cultures into Canada's democracy. Let's just understand, Eric, a little more how this works, because uh, Mamdou says you've all worked together, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you know, but I'm going to suggest to you that the people watching this right now may not know, because yeah. most of what we read, see, and hear in the papers and in the media about you guys fighting with each other as opposed to working together. Does Mohammed call you up and say, we got some Syrian refugees coming here, Let's get on board. Let's do something. How does his, it work? His, his, his uh, VP research did. Yeah. It precisely that. More or that. Less. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, <laughs> linking back to what we started with, transportation, uh, that was our first project working together in a kind of overt way uh, where, you know, the four universities came together, jointly funded, planned, implemented, and, and are now analyzing uh, the results of this work. It helped build a kind of cooperative framework within which we could do new things beyond that and so when Ryerson took the the lead on the refugee uh, response uh, it was actually very easy because we'd already uh, established the kind of working relationships to come together very quickly be behind Ryerson's leadership and uh, and get all four institutions working together so we now have quarterly dinners I hosted the first one uh, at Massey College, and uh, my counterparts have, have hosted subsequent dinners to talk about uh, what more we can do together. Uh, because even though we do compete, we realize that we can achieve a lot by working together uh, in service to our students, our faculty, and our staff. It we works. had some important guests at those dinners. Um, we had the pleasure of meeting with Mayor Tory and um, shared with him some of our concerns around transit and transportation, also um, ways that we could potentially work with the city's resources around um, uh, campus development and affordable housing, and you know, outlined a bit of an agenda. So as, as a team, we did set an agenda for so ourselves. So you tell him that, and then what do you hear back from him? Um, you know, I think that there is an ability to listen, um, especially when four presidents um, mm -hmm. get together and have a shared, uh, coherent voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, your combined um, budgets are what? I mean, well, ours alone is 2.3 billion, just uh, operating plus research, which is about a billion and. So we're talking five billion, billion dollars. In, in our annual economic so impact, lots. and we're tiny, mm -hmm. is 300 million. A year. That's our economic impact for OCADU. For OCADU, five thousand students, right? So think about their economic impact on the yeah, city. But the mayor did say, "What can the city do to help you?" Yeah. Uh, and it was a great opportunity, a, a wonderful moment, because I don't know uh, when the four of us or our predecessors last sat down together with the mayor and had that conversation. Mohammed. I would just add that the collaboration extends beyond just the four presidents. Actually, we have a synergy between faculty. We have thousands of faculty members that they collaborate on a regular basis. We have some existing joint programs with the York University. We have a PhD program that uh, started 15 years ago in communication and culture. And that actually started because of good collaboration between faculty members. So I think uh, the, the collaboration is really uh, deeper that, than that. And uh -huh. our role is to enhance the, the type of partnership we have. Okay, I get to believe the, the skeptical journalist here for a second saying, come on, you guys compete a lot too, oh, right? You want to be as good as his law school and you think your law school is better than his law school. I thought our law school is better. Well, there we <laughs> see, okay, no, there we go. But let me, no, that's, you know, it is true and at the end of the day, honestly, when you reflect on, on what we do, we have a, a very important job that is very critical for the future of Canada, future of the world, because I keep saying that we prepare students to be world citizens rather than just... Uh, uh, so that we, we appreciate the responsibility in our hands. We obviously compete. We compete for infrastructure, for uh, government money and what have you. But we also realize, as Merck said, if we put our heads together, we can do an awful lot. We are very significant in size. This city and this country needs an awful lot of knowledge-based decision-making, knowledge-based initiatives. We have the people, we have the best brains among the, some of the best brains in the world, in almost every discipline. If you put the four together, in almost every discipline, discipline of knowledge, if we can put our heads together and collaborate, 
uh, we can really do very well and we can help social and economic development in the country. I think the idea that universities are just competing, honestly, I think it's, 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 a, it's an old idea. Uh, we realize that although universities have done that all along, our job, although fundamentally will always be uh, training next generation, preparing the next generation of, of citizens, uh, creating knowledge and disseminating knowledge, we also realize that we have a job to make sure as we disseminate knowledge, we make sure that this knowledge being disseminated is actually in a form and in a situation where it can be rapidly employed to enhance the quality of life for everybody, hmm. whether it's health, industry, what have you. So we can make an impact. The more we work together, the more we can rapidly deploy the knowledge that, that we are creating and help society deploy that knowledge. Okay, but having said that, whose law school is better? <laughs> no, no, no never mind. Moving on. Moving on. We, but, we, ours is old, though. That's <laughs> all, which is interesting. But we literally are city builders. I mean, if you look yeah. at um, yeah. both campus expansion, and you'll see some new infrastructure from OCADU shortly, um, you know, we have a, had a huge impact on neighborhoods, on the quality of those neighborhoods, on their sustainability, on the kind of vitality and energy of them. And I think as universities have matured in this century, we also treat the urban environment as a living laboratory. Hmm. So, you know, our students our faculty um, are out within the GTA um, working with those communities to help vitalize them, to give them the kind of skills they need to be effective in sometimes very challenging times. Okay, it's a very let, diverse city. Let me, let me see if I can stir up a little trouble here. And I'll go with your two universities, both of which are big institutions. You don't mind. That's why you, know. <laughs> you are the University of Toronto. I have heard people describe Ryerson, though, as the university for and in Toronto. Mm -hmm differently because you know what they've done with Maple Leaf Gardens, what they've done with uh, some of the properties at Young and Dundas, the Canadian Tire Building, Ted Rogers School and so on and so forth. Do you take umbrage when people say that because the suggestion here is that you're a little more within an enclave of downtown Toronto as opposed to really enmeshed right. within downtown Toronto? Actually I, I love what Ryerson has done uh, to really embrace the city uh, and you know when I became president as an urban geographer I figured play to your strengths. To me it was obvious that uh, we had all kinds of good reasons to really embrace the city in ways that perhaps we hadn't done for a long time. Um, I made the case that the success of a university like U of T depends directly on the quality of life in the GTA. So anything we can do to improve that quality of life helps ourselves. It helps us attract and retain great faculty from across mm -hmm. Canada and around the world. Similarly, it helps us recruit fantastic students and great staff. Uh, so for me, it was a no-brainer. The, the good news is that when I started taking this message out to the rest of the, the university community, they all agreed because they're all Torontonians and, and they love the city that they live in. So it actually was a very easy sell for us. But we are actually now uh, very much engaged in all kinds of city building projects, both physical building as well as, of course, getting our students out into the city, working through internships and placements, service learning. It's what they want and need, but it also benefits our community partners. I guess I should acknowledge my conflict of interest in this uh, setting here. I'm a graduate of your university. I'm a visiting professor of your university. I took courses last summer at your university. And I'm going up to your university later today to participate in, I, I, I probably spent every Saturday at your university at the Archives of Ontario, uh, where, where my so-called papers are held, actually, okay. doing research for a book I'm working on. So I've got, uh, oh, and then there's that Laurentian thing, too. There, there's some, so <laughs> anyway, I get my uh, conflicts all on the table so there. There is um, something, I think, that we've done together, which is to turn um, Toronto, the GTA, into um, a leading city in digital industries and ICT. And we have collaborated a great deal in that project. Um, often not at our level, but through research, through uh, company incubation, through having four universities with incredible design and creative capacity, um, as well as the computational strengths that are really core to Toronto. And we've seen uh, Toronto benchmarks. So for example, um, launching tonight is something called Level Up, 1,000 um, indie games designed by students from all four universities, started with an OCAD University U of T collaboration. And I think you'll see more and more of that kind of impact, and now uh, Ryerson and, and York are part of that consortium as well. So, you know, there's a way where we affect the economic capacity of Toronto that doesn't always get Can recognized. Can I pick up on, on uh, you, you mentioned housing several minutes ago, and I yeah. want to pick up on that, because you're all, I guess, 
I mean, you're in the education business, but you're in the housing business in a major way, right? Now, even though 80% of your students are commuting, Mohammed, I, I, you've, you've got to have place for a, the other 20% living on campus, I guess, don't you? Definitely, we, uh, we are increasing our capacity in terms of serving students who would like to, uh, uh, to stay on campus. And uh, our approach is always about city building and how we can collaborate with uh, partners outside to serve our students better. And, uh, the innovation agenda that we have it actually applies to what we are doing in the DMZ, but also other areas where we are also creating uh, opportunities for our students. Uh, I, I have news for you, Steve. Mm -hmm. We are considering, as of course, the uh, the transportation project is continuing, and as I said, people will be our colleagues will be mining the results for a long time to come, and you will see various reports that will come out. But our next project. We started some preliminary discussions that the four of us, again, are going to fund our colleagues to work on affordable housing. Hmm. So it goes even beyond students. Now, here's the thing. You've got, if I can put it this way, you've got the space up there to do stuff on housing yeah. that you really don't have. I mean, you're really in downtown, well, for the downtown the, campus. Although we actually do uh, have some innovative opportunities. So we're working with the Huron-Sussex neighborhood, which is the neighborhood just to the west of our St. George campus, really. Um, between Huron and Spadina, mm -hmm. uh, south of Bloor. For people to, out of town, yeah. sort of where the Robarts Library so is. So just, just behind Robarts Library. Yeah. And we're actually going to be building laneway housing there, working with the City of Toronto and with Evergreen mm -hmm. to uh, really intensify uh, urban development there, make more efficient use of an already dense neighborhood, creating affordable housing, which will also be very, very green. Again, a terrific design project for our students, a wonderful demonstration project for us to figure out how we can add new housing capacity more inexpensively and affordably and in a way that keeps our carbon footprint as small as possible. Is that for your students or for the general population? It would be for both. For both? Yeah. Huh. And, and okay. a lot of us are in very deep conversations with the developer community um, to talk about what kind of um, strategies and policies not only the city but the province and the federal government need to bring in to look at affordable housing. That includes students, but you know a larger um, a larger set of communities. The other great opportunity is the waterfront. And a number of us are very involved um, with looking at its future. Um, I now see. Tell me about that. You, n none of you has campuses on well, the. We're, we're planning a campus. You're on the planning a campus we on are the waterfront. Indeed. Yes. Whereabouts? Um, it will be um, in the city uh, for the arts um, that um, Mitch Cohen has been developing. Okay. And, uh, we're Daniels the, Group. Yeah, the Daniels Group. We're, the, we're currently where the government, where the government like club used to be. For those who know Toronto, legacy club culture. Right. Um, That's not government spelled government. That's. How do they G spell it? G G U V G or something? Yeah. Yeah. G -U -V. Um, yeah. And uh, but but the reason that we want to be there is because uh, again, and I think you'll see collaborations roll up bet between the four universities in that space. Um, that is a living laboratory. That's about sustainability, zero carbon design, about the future of an innovation district. Um, and there's huge potential in that space also for affordable housing and student housing as mm -hmm. all of the planning comes into place. So you've got um, this great Huron uh, neighborhood, but then you've got this large multi-acre opportunity for the kind of um, skill sets that our institutions represent to really help Toronto do something different on the waterfront. In our remaining moments, I want to raise the issue that I think has been uh, very front and center, uh, certainly since the Ontario budget came out, and that is this notion of free tuition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we've discovered, it's not exactly free. There are other, you know, associated expenses that are not paid for. Uh, but in the main, it's an attempt, I guess, by the province of Ontario to repurpose all of the money going into grants and bursaries and scholarships and so on into this big new fund, which for household incomes of less than $50,000 a year, you've now got a shot at a pretty much free education. Merrick, how might this change the lives of the students who are going to go to U of T? Oh, well, qu quite considerably, uh, because what uh, the government is proposing to do, and I think it's really quite brilliant, is to not just collect all of the different forms of social support for education into one pool, but to front end load that money and make it available for students when they are starting their education. So it really does diminish the kind of psychological barrier that students otherwise would confront when they're contemplating the decision whether or not even to apply. And that was a real thing. It's, this is a real thing, and we believe it will actually uh, succeed in attracting more students from low-income families and low-income backgrounds, and we're very, very excited by that. Mom, do you think there really were students who didn't even think about university life because they thought the tuition was too high? 
Absolutely, and I think also, uh, just back to something, uh, to follow up with something Merck just said, one of the things that we have observed that are many of our students who come from families that probably did not have, which York has a lot of them, who did not go, no, no member of their families have been to university before, are unaware of the opportunities before them. So because of, to be honest, of the complexity of the system that existed. And that complexity happened because every few years we identify a need, we add a new program, a third program, and so on. Now it's all in one program. The idea that they don't, it will be uh, a front-loaded uh, will be seen for somebody who's still in grade eight and nine who do not have, uh, who does not have the uh, uh, backing of a family that understands the system mm -hmm. may consider that, well, university isn't for me because I, I don't, they, everybody talks about how, but if they know that the first year or the first couple of years because of the family situation that he will have free education, then they will start thinking about university other than give that option up early in life. And that is one of the problems. It's not only in terms of, of people coming from uh, uh, poor uh, background, but also for women. There's also, also another issue, with, particularly in certain areas of study, where early on, they somehow, because of the environment that they are in, they are not aware of the opportunities that can be available to them, and they exclude that, and hence, basically, they miss it when they, are ready for, when they should have been ready for it. Sarah, what impact it, will this have? Um, well, there's also more flexibility in how the money can be distributed, and there's some... Um, people who come from cultures that um, do not accept loans and now students can actually choose to have a bursary only um, and still have support from the government. Um, we have a big focus on Indigenous um, students and recruiting from those communities and um, just as my colleagues have said having a, a more clear road of um, entry but also a focus on students who come from uh, lower economic, socioeconomic capacity, we believe that the numbers of students who come from Indigenous communities will rise, um, or urban Indigenous communities and families will rise, and it's a big priority for us. So we're very excited about it. It's, it is a very smart move to um, create more accessibility. What do they think at Ryerson about this? I think, first of all, we have to applaud the government for taking uh, this initiative. It's, it's a brilliant. Uh, from the student perspective, I think this will simplify the process for them. It will be easier to understand from the beginning when they apply to, um, to any university. Uh, from the perspective of the implementation, I think it's going to be challenging for the universities, but that's a price to pay in order uh, to facilitate the uh, participation uh, for students. And I think uh, the overall um, outcome of this will have better participation from students. Uh, I'll just add the element, I think, uh, for all of us, uh, if there's any area where we should probably work together, is really doing more things for the Aboriginal communities in Toronto. We have the largest concentration of Aboriginal communities in the country, and I think if we are talking about uh, doing things together, this is an area where we can do more, and I'm sure that we'll get also support from all uh, levels of government. It's a great point this. because there's actually um, quite significant scholarship amongst the four universities mm -hmm. in terms of Indigenous yeah. culture, history, law, health, etc. Um, but we haven't looked at that. So I think you've just raised um, our next, uh, after affordable housing, our next focus. That's hmm. exciting. Are you hearing any feedback though? Because I know the initial feedback that, uh, that some people got was the government is portraying this as quote unquote free education, but it's not really. There's a few strings attached. Are you hearing any negative feedback associated with that? Everybody got quiet all of a sudden. It's actually, it is the real deal. Um, I think, you know, if you are um, in that category where your household income, uh, including your family income, is less than $50,000, it will not only cost you nothing, you'll actually have net support in addition. So if you're in a professional program, um, which is more expensive than the basic arts and science program, it doesn't cover that entire um, tuition. So I think some of the complaints or the concerns have come specifically from um, some of those areas of enrollment. But it's important to point out that those programs usually have very significant additional bursary and scholarship that have been um, you know, raised by the university sector to offset students to ensure that there's affordability within professional programs. You know, Canada is amazing. Um, even if we 
always want more support in terms of your institutions and need it in our operating budgets, et cetera. When you look at the opportunity in this country versus the United States and many others, I think we're all really deeply committed to accessibility and this is a really great move to keep our, you know, our post-secondary system and universities democratic and open. And public. And public, and yeah. Public. Can I just finally observe, and uh, Sheldon, you may want to go to a wide shot on this one here. <laughs> Mamdou Shukri is the head of York University, is from Egypt originally. Sarah Diamond from OCADU is from New York City. The Bronx. The Bronx. Okay, the Bronx. <laughs> the Bronx. Merrick Gertler here is from Edmonton, Alberta originally. Correct. And you're from Algeria originally. Yes. And it says something I suspect kind of neat about the province of Ontario that um, uh, it seems to be a fairly welcoming place for people who run our four biggest universities in the capital city. It says a lot about the country and about people who live in this country and about uh, the policies that were adopted in this country for a long time that makes everybody feel comfortable and welcome. It is a, and uh, I think this is one of the great advantages that we as educational institutions are enjoying when we try to recruit uh, uh, faculty, recruit uh, students. Uh, this is the best country in the world by any measure and uh, the evidence is, is there and uh, we have only one responsibility, very important, which is to make sure through our universities, through the work universities, that Canada continue to be the leader in inclusion in the world and the source of, uh, of pride for all of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really do represent um, cultural and uh, religious diversity as we uh, look at each other on this uh, panel. And I think that's <laughs> a very good statement for, uh, for the possibilities uh, for Canada and also for the GTA. If may, I may add uh, the importance also for Toronto as uh, a world-class city. I think this is uh, a reflection of um, the element of diversity, but also Toronto is a hub for talented people that are coming to Toronto from all around the world to contribute to this uh, great city. And we are very pleased to be uh, in a city that is welcoming, but also in a city that is giving opportunities for universities to contribute. And uh, part of what we do is really to uh, add uh, to the reputation of our great city. I should give the last word to my alma mater. And, and I would only <laughs> add that um, you know the four people you see uh, sitting around this table represent our institutions in microcosm in that our universities are magnets for talent. Uh, mm -hmm. We also draw fantastic talent to Toronto from around the world. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the benefits, I think, that uh, we want to help Torontonians understand a bit better than they do now. You shouldn't say that so loud when it comes to faculty negotiating time. You'll be sorry you said that. <laughs> anyway, can I thank, um, on the left-hand side of the table there, Mamdou Shukri and Sarah Diamond from York University and OCAD U, respectively, and Merrick Gertler and Mohamed Lashami from U of T and Ryerson, respectively. It's been great to have you four university presidents at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Delighted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.